say that this information will be relevant whether you're a multi-person agency or a solo freelancer or a solopreneur. However you define yourself, I think there's something that you're going to be able to take away from this talk. But I do kind of want to gauge from the room. Can you raise your hand if you are a freelancer or work on your own? All right, awesome. And then can you raise your hand if you work with a larger team? All right, cool. We've got a good mix. And then another question, how many of y'all have project managers you work with? All right, and then how many of you manage your own projects? All right, uh, if you have a project manager, give them a hug when you see them. They probably need it. Uh, for those that manage their own projects, I'm giving free hugs at the end of this, so just come up. I need one, too. Um, but seriously, what, I don't want to oversell what I do because I couldn't do anything I do without my team. But it can be hard. Dealing with clients can be frustrating. And it's a bit of an art and a science. So uh, a little bit of context as to why this topic is important. That's where we're going to start. Um, then we're going to walk through the parts of our process at Ingenious. Uh, and how we prioritize customer service at each stage. So even if your process looks different than ours, and it probably will, and even if you don't have multiple departments and teammates that are helping you out with all of this stuff, the principles we discuss will be pertinent to you and your business. We'll cover the importance of customer service during the sales process, uh, during the project itself once the sale's closed, when wrapping the project up and launching, and then also uh, long after the website is launched. And I think there's valuable content there even if you don't provide ongoing support for your clients. We will have time at the end for questions, so please, if you have anything, just hold it until then. So I, before I dive into the nitty gritty of customer service, I want to provide a little context as to why this was something I was thinking about in the first place. So about a year ago, we were doing a lot of inbound marketing, a lot of content marketing, and we were trying to figure out why do our clients work with us? We were making buyer personas, trying to identify the trends across what were the major factors that sold them on us. And a lot of the things we were talking about was all based on conjecture. We assumed they liked certain things, and we weren't really just asking them. And so we conducted a survey of our clients to try and figure out why they worked with us. And we imagined it had to do with our great design work, our awesome support system, or maybe our competitive price point. And while some of these, if not all, played a part in their decision to work with us, the number one reason was because of our team. They liked us, and that was enough to drive their decision to work with us. And this was a big surprise for us. I mean, obviously, we love our team. I mean, look at us. We're adorable. Like, <laughs> we're great. Like, I love my team. But I never would have thought that, that was the number one reason that people were dropping thousands of dollars to work with us. And so... And, I and mean, also the other thing is liking us is one thing, but it's not enough to retain clients. And so I started to think about other things that affect all of this and things I've been hearing from clients out of these surveys, uh, things that I wasn't really looking for, they just kind of came up. And one of the things that I heard over and over and over again, with, whether it was about an agency or an ind independent person they were working with, is that they sucked at customer service. They were really, really bad at it. They didn't answer calls or they took weeks to respond. They created timelines and then completely ignored them. They made promises that they never kept. And they disappeared as soon as the project was done, offering no ongoing support or charging high costs to make simple changes. Now, people often come to you having some form of experience with an agency or freelancer. And more often than not, if they're coming to you, it was probably a negative experience. And no matter how great you are at your job, you'll have to deal with the unconscious bias that they have towards you as a result of their poor experience. They may respond more emotionally or more strongly than a situation warrants. They may have trust issues, and it may take more time to build up a healthy relationship. It may start to sound like you're a counselor, and that's kind of what you're doing to a certain extent. You're having to read people and understand what they're feeling. You have to have good emotional intelligence. And all this really is to say that customer service isn't easy. You can't please everyone no matter how good you write your job, and it's impossible to keep 100% of your client base satisfied. You can't control how people react. All you can do is control how you treat people and how hard you're willing to work to satisfy them. My boss said something recently that really stuck with me, which was this. Expectations don't really change regardless of how much money you have to spend. If you're spending $1 million, you're expecting a $1 million return. If you're spending $3,000, you're expecting a $1 million return. The pressure to do great work does not change from small to big businesses. And I believe this is indicative of why customer service can be so hard. People are expecting the best no matter how much they pay you. But that doesn't mean you should lose hope. There are ways to keep your customers happy, produce great work, and stay sane in the process. 
So, are you ready to find out how? Yes. Yeah. All right. So, it all starts with sales. Customer service isn't something that begins once you have a client in the door. It starts the moment you begin to interact with the prospect. The relationship you form during the sales process has a big impact on the rest of the project. So it's critical to make a good first impression. Now the first thing to do, and this is gonna sound really rudimentary to some of you, but I heard this complaint over and over so I had to mention, is make sure you have a sales team or make sure you are responsive and available. Um, I've talked with clients before who tried to conduct research on our competitors before, like when deciding who to work with, and sometimes our competitors wouldn't just uh, return calls, like forget to return calls, they wouldn't pick up the phone in the first place. So don't be that person. Pick up your phone, and even if you don't have time to talk, provide clear expectations on when you can reach back out. People don't like being left in the dark, and setting clear expectations is always key to customer service success. This is something you're gonna hear me say over and over and over again. Clear expectations, that's huge. So once you have those basics down, you should be selling consultatively. Uh, this is our approach to the sales process, and we believe it's a huge part of what makes us successful. Now, selling consultatively doesn't mean giving away your business expertise for free during the sales process. It really just means listening to your potential client. Now, I know that can be uh, a little hairy. It can be hard to know how much time should I invest in this before I'm willing to just push forward. And one way we, we try to look at it is think about the opportunity cost. If you see that this could be a huge referral part, partner for you down the road, if you see this is an opportunity to get a lot of ongoing services, then spend some extra time on the front end like really digging into it because it could pay off in the end. Another reason that this is really important to us is because we decided early on that we didn't want to just spit out websites and digital services just because we could. We wanted to truly be partners with our clients and help them achieve their business goals. And this is something we reiterate over and over again from the sales process all the way through launch is that we want to be your partner. We want to help you. Um, so we're going to look briefly at the way our sales approach has evolved over the years to be always, less always be closing and less about touting all the pros of our work and more about solving the client's pain. Initial sales meetings are often called discovery meetings, so have the hindsight that you're the one discovering things about them, not the reverse. So at this stage, there's not much to be gained by talking about how many pages the site should have or how you can digitize the PDF forms. All of that's gonna come later. Focus instead on the pain of the client. Uh, focus on what they're telling you and take lots of notes so you can figure out solutions for this pain after the meeting. It's okay to share some broad ideas for solutions, but don't get caught up in the nitty gritty details at this point. For example, perhaps point to the past work you've done that solved a similar problem to instill confidence, but don't start sketching the homepage even if you can already envision it. Um, and these are just some of the open-ended questions that we'd like to ask during the sales process. This isn't comprehensive, this isn't all of them, and we wouldn't necessarily ask every single one of these with every single prospect, but I think they're a good reflection of the kind of information you're trying to get at this stage. You're trying to find out why do you want to do this in the first place? What are your long-term business goals? Um, what's going to be success for you? How are you going to be satisfied at the end of this project? Again, it's setting clear expectations. If you know what they want this early in the process, it's going to make it that much easier to deliver it down the road. So after you've asked all the pertinent questions and have a thorough understanding of your prospect's business and challenges, write a detailed proposal. By crafting a comprehensive proposal, you can demonstrate that you get the prospect's business. This also gives a clearly defined scope of work that will set clear expectations and keep the project on track from start to finish. The importance of a clear scope of work cannot be overstated, and I think this quote does a great job of summing up why. We've heard from clients that when working with other agencies or freelancers, they didn't know what was included in the project and what was expected of themselves or the people they were hiring. Um, this makes it difficult, if not impossible, to keep communication clear and transparent. Think about it. This is an industry where basically anything is possible. But that doesn't mean it's included in the project. If a client wants something that's out of scope but you didn't have a clearly defined scope of work in the first place, it makes sense that they'd be confused or upset when you tell them that you, they can't have what they want or that it'll cost extra. And it can also be really frustrating for you if you feel like you're back into a corner and you have no way to defend yourself or explain why they can't do that. Within your proposal, also be realistic with your timeline. Most people complain about their agencies missing deadlines, and if the prospect wants a fast project but it isn't realistic given what they want, don't overpromise. It can seem easy sometimes to take on a project just because you need the money or because it seems like a good opportunity, but if you tell them you can complete it when you know it's not realistic, that's going to hurt you down the road, and it would have been a better idea just to let it pass. And last but not least, be honest about what you can provide. If you're a single web designer, make it clear that you may be unresponsive at times due to the demands of your other clients. 
if you won't be able to provide ongoing support, give them that information on the front end. If you lock someone into an agreement without setting these expectations on the front end, it's going to cause problems down the road. So if you listen on the front end, identify your prospect's needs, and address them extensively in a quality proposal, it will make the rest of the project much easier. It's not going to solve all your problems. You're still going to run into issues. But this type of sales process prepares our team really well for working with a client because we know their motivation for the project. And it also prepares the client for our process. They're already starting to know what they should expect when they're really in the door. So once you've wowed the prospect with your comprehensive sales process and convinced them to sign your proposal, it's time to get the project started. At this point, customer service becomes even more important, obviously. The client is now paying you, so they'll expect a certain level of service. And your sales team has already started to set expectations for what it will be like to work with you. So you'll need to be sure you understand those expectations and can deliver on the promises they've made. So start by sitting down with your sales team and getting all the information they've gathered up until this point. <laughs> Review the proposal, figure out the pain points of the client and why they're working with you, and try to get a feel for their personality. This will help you anticipate their attitude and understand how to best communicate with them. This is a small point, but I think it's really important, and it's something I've kind of had to learn like stumbling through it as a project manager. But people communicate very, very differently, and they'll respond very differently depending on how you reach out to them. I have some clients who they'll send me one-sentence emails that are super like blunt to the point, and they like me to send them the same kind of stuff. They don't need paragraphs. They don't need me to explain things. They just want short answers. I have other clients, I need to send them an essay every email. They want me to explain everything. They want to know all the details. And that's okay. Like, it can be frustrating, it can be time consuming, but if you know that at the very beginning and you start communicating in that way, then you're going to avoid frustration later on. Also, this is a great show if you haven't seen it, Gravity Falls. Okay, so now onto some just uh, more practical tips during the project itself that you can use. So after you've downloaded the info from your sales team's brain, it's time to really get things started. And the following are just some general tips. So first, and I've already kind of mentioned this, be responsive. Don't make your, feel, your clients feel ignored or forgotten. Um, being responsive is critical. At Genius, we always respond to communication from a client within 24 hours. Now that doesn't mean you should immediately react to everything you receive, because being reactive usually spells disaster and results in emotional outbursts instead of thoughtful responses especially if you receive something from a client that's frustrating or upsetting. In situations like this, and when you don't have an immediate answer or solution to what's being discussed, at least let the client know that they've been heard. That will keep them from freaking out and thinking that they're being ignored or forgotten. Send a quick email back saying that you've seen their message and you're working through it. If you're on a call, simply tell them that you don't have the answer now and you want to do your due diligence before telling them something. This will give you the additional time to collect yourself and figure out how to move forward and will make the client feel heard and keep them from worrying unnecessarily. And this is something I do all the time. If I get an email at the end of the day on a Friday afternoon and it's going to take a lot of critical thinking or maybe it, it just makes me angry because I did, wasn't expecting that kind of feedback or that kind of answer, I just say, hey, I, I saw this. I'm going to need a little time to sit on it. I'll give you a response early Monday morning or something. Because really all they want to know is that you saw that and that you're thinking about it. Otherwise, if you leave them in the dark, they're just going to start, their imaginations are going to run wild. And to them, anything could be possible. So settle them down and make them feel heard. Next, honesty is key. Uh, be honest every step of the way. If there's a delay that will slow down the project, tell the client before they become concerned. Addressing potential problems before they arise will keep communication and expectations clear. And be honest about failure. Studies have shown that the best clients and the biggest advocates of your business are the ones that dealt with the mistake that you made, uh, but were delighted when you admitted your mistake and did everything you could to fix it. Nobody's perfect and no one expects you to be, but being honest about that is critical. Fail fast. Mistakes are inevitable, handle them with grace. Failure and mistakes are what help us learn, and they push us to acknowledge our shortcomings and grow. That doesn't mean you should aim for failure, obviously, but it does mean that you should be accepting of it. Workplaces that severely punish failure or outright don't tolerate it are toxic and lead to stagnation. If you want to get better, you have to fall off the horse a couple times. So you need to create a culture where it's okay to fail, where it's okay to try something really hard and fall short. A culture that feels fa fears failure will never take risks. It also leads to dishonesty with your clients, and as we just learned, that's never the right way to do things. 
So if you're a leader in your agency or a freelancer, it's critical to create an environment in which there isn't a fear of failure. And tied up with this is the fact that the quicker you fail, the quicker you can learn from the experience. And that's really the key. You have to learn from it. Um, I heard a quote on a TED radio hour, and I can't remember the speaker now, of course, but uh, it really stuck with me where he said, being bad with failure isn't being mad that you made the mistake or making the mistake in the first place. Being bad with failure is either not learning from it and repeating those mistakes or not addressing the mistake in the first place and letting it run out of control. Because in the end, that's just going to create more systemic problems and it's going to be an even bigger headache for you in the end. Don't be a yes man. Be willing to push back. More often than not, your clients will appreciate this. They've hired you as an expert. Sometimes it will seem like they don't want to listen, and sometimes that might be the case. But if you're patient and able to talk through things with the client, you may be able to convince them that using papyrus as their body font is a bad idea. <laughs> now, one caveat to this is that sometimes, no matter how much you try to explain your reasoning or help a client make the best decision for their business, they won't want to listen. Part of good customer service isn't just knowing when to push back, but knowing when to concede. Knowing which battles are worth fighting and which ones aren't worth the effort. You may have to make some decisions that you don't like as a designer, but which will make the relationship much better and result in a happy client. Keep in mind that this isn't about what you want as a designer, but about providing a great experience for the end user, i.e. your client's prospects and customers. So if the client wants to do something that you don't like design-wise, but which won't negatively affect the end user experience, you should be more open to it. And if you manage projects on your own and don't have an intermediary to facilitate these conversations, just keep asking yourself questions like, who is my target audience and will this affect their experience? This will help keep things in perspective and make it easier to concede when necessary. This is something that's really top of mind for me because I know I work with a designer on my team um, and he's super brilliant and I appreciate everything he has to say, but sometimes we'll get pushback from a client and he really disagrees with it and he feels strong and he wants to talk through it. And I tell him, to be honest, from my perspective, if I was this end user, I wouldn't even notice that change. It would make no difference to me. And I understand and appreciate your perspective, but trying to convince the client otherwise and go through this conversation, one, it's going to hurt the relationship, and two, it is going to be wasted time in the end because it's really not going to affect the end user anyway. So that can be really hard, when, especially when you're the designer and managing your own projects. You want, to, you, know, you want the work to be a good representation of who you are. But again, it's not about you. It's about your client, and really, it's about your client's prospects and customers. Handling scope creep. There was a really good talk earlier today on scope creep. If you didn't check it out, I highly recommend you watch it once the video comes out. Uh, this is going to be really just lightly touching on it. So if you've managed a project, you're probably intimately familiar with scope creep. Even if you craft an extremely detailed scope of work on the front end of the project, chances are the client will try to add some additional features or functionality down the line. Like I said before, we work in an industry where nearly anything is possible. Working through the project, your client will naturally start to have new ideas and input as they think through things more thoroughly. Navigating these conversations can be complicated and difficult, but they're critical for success in keeping clients satisfied. So when clients start to ask if something is doable, don't feel the need to give them an immediate answer. If it's clearly in scope, tell them so. And if it's out of scope, tell them and offer to estimate any additional costs. And if you're not sure, tell them you'll get back to them. This is directly tied to not being a yes man. If you immediately agree to anything your clients ask, you're bound to agree to something out of scope. The other reason it's important to address scope creep is because it prevents you from doing free work and helps clients understand the value of the work you do. Offering discounts or making exceptions may seem like a good idea in the moment, but it often results in clients appreciating and valuing your work less. And they've, all, they've actually done studies on this. When you make exceptions and give discounts and stuff, they value what you're giving them less. They see it as being cheaper and not worth as much. So stand by your process and your team and make sure you get paid for the work you do. I really believe in this. Um, this is something we've struggled with as an agency and we faced a lot. And it was really prevalent because our heart's really in the nonprofit world. That's kind of where our agency got its start. And we offered full grants for a while where we would build a website for someone from start to finish uh, for local nonprofits in our area, valued at around $10,000. And a lot of clients were great, but we also had a lot of clients that really took advantage of us. They didn't have any buy-in. There wasn't really a clear scope of work. So anything and everything was possible for them. And the project dragged on so long and they kept adding more and more and more. And we felt like we didn't have a leg to stand on to say otherwise. 
So we've adjusted that now where we do partial grants. So let's say we have someone who has $5,000 that they can spend on a site, then we'll do the other half of the work for free. And we've seen it works much better. People have more buy-in, they're more engaged. Uh, it's clear what's actually included in the project, and it's been a huge help for us. So I really can't emphasize that enough. The work you do is valuable. Make sure you get paid for it. Outline next steps. Again, don't leave your clients in the dark. Uh, at, as always, communication and setting clear expectations is key. After every meeting or conversation, outline what will come next. If the client won't hear from you for a few weeks because you'll have your head down building their site, let them know. If you need something from them before you can move forward, make sure they know that too. Follow up after meetings and phone calls with an email which outlines the next steps of, and whether or not anything is needed from the client. Over communicating is better than under communicating and ultimately your clients will be thankful for it. It also ensures that you have a record of what you've told the client. If they try to claim they didn't know you were waiting on something, having a clear record of what you asked for and when will give you a leg to stand on during those conversations. Now keep in mind, this isn't about being defensive or playing the blame game. It's just making sure that you have a written record of what's been discussed so that you can clearly show them what has and hasn't been said. Um, it is, to, I mean, it is to defend yourself if you are in a situation where they're trying to tell you, oh, we're behind track and it's your fault. And you're like, well, no, I asked for this for two weeks ago and you never responded. Um, so that's why it's important. And then out of these tips, last and certainly not least, is patience is a virtue. Be patient. You're going to be asked questions that you think are common sense and annoying. You're going to deal with frustrating, frustrating individuals that contradict themselves and go back on their word. And you're going to deal with trust issues. A lot of people have been burned by web designers and agencies in the past, and they're going to carry these old wounds into the relationship with you. Recognizing this is important because someone may get angry or upset with you for no reason other than they're having flashbacks to that past experience. The key here is to always make sure your clients feel heard. Even if they're responding inappropriately to a situation, making the client feel understood will help immensely in diffusing the situation. Sometimes clients just want to process things verbally. I've experienced this firsthand where a client will call me livid. They're, they want to yell at me, they want to blame me for something, and I just let them get it out. I say, I just sit back, I say, tell me what's wrong, tell me why you're upset, and I literally just let them get it all out. Sometimes the result is they're totally calm afterwards. Other times they're still angry, and so I say, hey, I hear you, I don't think this is gonna get us anywhere right now, let's continue this conversation next week. Trying to get to someone and have a constructive conversation when they're already heated, you're probably not gonna get anywhere and you may make things worse. So know that you don't have to resolve it then. You can make them feel heard, but you can address it later. And then another thing to keep in mind, and I'm gonna get kind of philosophical here, but everyone is living complicated lives, so a client's attitude could change immensely depending on countless factors a deadline that their boss is pestering them about, a fight with their spouse, having to clean up dog throat from their bed that morning. Um, as I mentioned earlier, try not to be reactive. Give your clients space to express, express themselves uh, and do your best to provide calm and collected input. Uh, there's a quote from a Tibetan Buddhist monk I love, her name's Pima Shadron, and she talks about how you don't have to play the character in your head of this drama you've created. Stop telling yourself stories about why the client's angry. Stop saying, oh, they want free work, and oh, they just don't understand. Let go of those assumptions, because you're just making yourself angry, and it's gonna make the conversation that much harder. Give them some space, give them the benefit of the doubt, and be patient. So, after launch. The way your agency runs will have a big impact on how you handle customer service after a website is launched. Uh, but whether you're retainer-based or project-based, closing out a project and following up with clients is an important part of the process. So often when we launch a website, this is how we want to react. But even if you don't provide ongoing support for your clients, there are some steps you can take to make them even more satisfied once the project is done. So I mentioned at the beginning of all of this that one of the main reasons I started to think about the importance of customer service is because of the surveys we conducted. Getting input from your clients is huge, because otherwise you're left guessing at what parts of your process worked well, what could have been improved, and what could be added or removed. Having consistent surveys that you send to clients immediately after a website launches will help you continually refine and improve your process. It's also another step in the process where you can make your clientele feel heard and valued. Now, honestly, survey making is a science in and of itself, and there are tons of great resources online you can use. Um, when I was crafting all these surveys for us, I just did a ton of research and I was able to get a 50% response rate, which is pretty unusual. And there's a lot of, there are a lot of steps you can take to do it, but just some practical tips I can give you now. 
keep the survey five to 10 questions long. Any longer will deter people from completing it, and any shorter will limit the amount of valuable feedback you can get. When you send the survey, provide an average for how long it'll take them to complete it. Uh, even at this stage, setting clear expectations is critical. If they know only the number of questions without knowing how comprehensive they are, again, their imaginations are gonna run wild and they may not even open it to see it in the first place. And limit the number of open-ended questions you ask. Try to give the user options to choose from. Again, making the survey easy to complete will increase the likelihood that your clients will actually fill it out. And make sure that you send this right after the project is done. You want it to be really fresh on their minds because, I mean, even a week or a month down the road, they're gonna start to forget what went well, what went poorly, and what the feedback they give you is gonna diminish in value. And then some other things that I was doing to try and increase our response rates included sending really personalized emails for each client, choosing clients that I knew were gonna be more responsive just on how they engaged with us already. So kind of read your client base as well and think about who would, one, who would give me good feedback in the first place, and not good as in you did a great job, but good as in can actually help you improve. Um, and then two, who's just actually responsive and, you know, gets back to me quickly. Another part of our process that we really like is the fact that we train our clients on how to use their websites. The training is usually pretty rudimentary and covers things like changing text, adding images, or adding new portfolio items, but it makes our clients feel empowered to update their sites. One complaint I've often heard is that after someone's website was launched, they had no ability to make simple changes, so the information on the website would quickly become outdated. They felt like their hands were tied and their site was being held hostage by their agency or freelancer. Don't make your clients feel like prisoners because the ultimate result is that they'll leave you for someone else. And finally, conduct a formal debrief with your team once the project is done. This is more so for the benefit of your team, but it will help you provide better customer service in the long run. By conducting debriefs, you can discuss what went well, what went poorly, and how your team can improve as a whole. You can address parts of the sales process that were unclear and led to an insufficient scope of work, and find inefficiencies within your team that caused delays or resulted in mistakes. You can find out how profitable the project was and devise a strategy for improving this in the future or replicating what you did well. Debriefing in this way helps prepare you for your next projects and equips your team with the knowledge necessary to do an even better job. And last, supporting clients post-launch. Not everyone has the ability or the desire to provide support for their clients post-launch, but it's a big part of our business and we think it's beneficial. While you may want to disappear after the website is finished, the reality is WordPress requires regular maintenance because updates are coming in like crazy. And those updates are important. Just get them long enough and you'll see things go to crap. So it really helps to develop a plan or train your clients on how to do updates. So whether you provide ongoing support to your clients and want some practical tips on how to do it well, or you just want to know how providing ongoing support can help generate more business, listen on. So first off, some practical ways to provide awesome customer service after you've launched the site. At this point, you should expect this first one. You'll need to set the right expectations. You should have started this on the front end of the project during the sales process, but this is another chance for you to reiterate yourself. Make it clear how your support system works. Do you use a ticketing system? Do all the support requests go directly to your cell phone? Do you provide support 24 seven or only cert during certain business hours? How long does it usually take for you to respond to a request? How long does it take for you to resolve a problem? Making these details as, cl uh, as clear if you want, oh sorry. Make these details clear if you want to minimize frustration and maximize satisfaction. Speaking of frustration, Keep in mind that your clients will often become frustrated when working through support requests. Unlike the web design process, when clients are more focused on design preferences, which sometimes are arguably more subjective, uh, support will often all be technical or mostly be technical. And since the client likely doesn't understand these technical aspects, they'll often become upset or frustrated simply because of their lack of knowledge to understand the problem and how it will be fixed. It's beyond preference, it's just over their head. So you need to be prepared for this attitude. Sometimes they're going to blame you even when it isn't your fault or do a really poor job of explaining the problem in the first place. As with everything else, try to remain patient, transparent, and do your best to solve their problem without causing more confusion in the process. So also, have a list of trusted vendors that can provide additional services to your clients. Even if you don't provide ongoing support or any other digital marketing services, know who can. Your customers will love that you have suggestions since that means less work for them. 
And if they trust you, they'll trust your recommendations. If you do this, they'll be more likely to come back to you for other services and recommendations in the future. And this is something even we do, even though we offer a ton of digital marketing services, we don't do branding, we don't do photography, we don't do videography. So we make sure we have a running list of vendors who we trust, who we like, kind of different ranges of price and stuff because we know we have a different range of clients and make sure that we have options if they have, ever have wants that we can't deliver on. Oh, one other thing with this slide, I forgot to include a little blurb about it, but one other thing that we've been doing um, is we've been providing ongoing education to our clients for a while now, and it's, it was kind of a combination of marketing effort and ongoing engagement effort. And so they're kind of similar to talks like these. Some of them are much more basic and going over the basics of things like SEO and SEM and Google Analytics and things like that. We'll probably get into some more advanced stuff down the road. But we have a lot of clients who attend them as well as potential clients and they really appreciate it. They love the fact that we're willing to share more of our knowledge and put time into it. And it also gives us a chance to just continually re-engage with them and continue those conversations. So support is huge for us because, as I stated earlier, we want our clients to see us as partners in their business. And we don't want them to see us this way. Now, don't get me wrong, providing support can cause headaches and definitely adds another layer of complexity to our business. But it also provides countless touch points for us to communicate with clients and sell additional services when they need them. Starting conversations about redesigning a website or starting SEO services is a lot easier when the client is already coming to you with a problem related to those things. It also doesn't feel salesy or forced. It feels like a genuine attempt to help them reach their goals because that's what it is. That's what it should be. And this is an important point that ties all of this together. Providing great customer service will keep the clients you already have and naturally get them to recommend you to others. Having referral partners and strong word of mouth marketing is indispensable. And the only way to strengthen this, those relationships is by providing stellar service and listening to your clients and prospects. That's it. Yes. I have a question about your follow-up surveys. Mm -hmm. Do you have sort of a uh, sort of a template, just a standard one that you send to all clients after the project ends, or do you customize it? And question number two is, do you use a product like SurveyMonkey or, or something like that, that like subscription based to send out? Yeah. So the question was, do we have like a template for the surveys that we send out once the website's gone live? And then the second part of the question was, do we use something like SurveyMonkey or another service for sending those uh, surveys? Uh, the question is yes to both. We have a template that we use whenever a client launches, and then we do use SurveyMonkey for that. It makes it really easy to analyze the results and send them out uh, mass. I will say for the surveys I conducted, Last year, we did kind of two surveys. One was like a competitive pricing one, and one was digging into why clients worked with us. I, those were very different, and any time I would do a survey like that, I'd make it extremely tailored uh, based on the kinds of information that you're looking for. Uh, and again, to speak, again, survey making really is a science in and of itself, so the kinds of questions you ask, the format that you put them in, those decisions should all be driven by what information you're looking for in the first place. Yeah. Do you tailor them based on the functionality? This was e-commerce, this was an e-commerce question. Um, honestly, most of our clients don't have a ton of difference in terms of those sorts of features, so, so we haven't had anything like that yet, but that wouldn't be a bad idea to include. Yeah? So I don't know if you have experience with this, but sometimes you sell the client on wanting to be a partner, and then they don't uphold their end of the deal, or, <laughs> they, don't, or they don't even want that. How do, you, uh, how do you explain to them, do you have any tips on explaining to them why it's worth it for them to be a partner? You know what I mean? Like they're paying you and they're happy to pay you, but sometimes you're not able to do all your work, so. Yes, we run into that all the time. There's no doubt about it. I mean, we'll have people who during the sales process are like, yes, absolutely, like I wanna be a partner and I trust you and you know, you're the experts and I wanna rely on everything you say. And then you actually get into the project and they don't want to do any of that. I mean, really, they don't. And so I don't think there's an easy answer to that, but I think on a very basic level, one, just reminding them of what they said in the first place, saying, hey, like you said you wanted to be a partner. Like I have records of the things that we talked about in the first place. Like Why is that different now? Asking good questions is good too, just asking why, why, why. Why is your, has your opinion changed? Why are things different now? Um, why has your perception of our relationship been altered? Things like that. Um, 
And I think sometimes you know you can you can bring clients. I've had the experience where some clients I've been able to convince them of you know yes, originally what you said is true, and I agree with that now. I have other clients where eventually I just have to concede, and I have to kind of balance like how can I get this project out the door while still remaining profitable and creating a product that's decent. Sometimes you result with something you're not super proud of. Maybe you don't want to even put your name on it. I mean, honestly. But in the end, it's going to save you so much time and money if you just push it out. Um, and it's not about delivering like a poor quality of service or a poor product. It's just it's delivering what they want, what they're paying for, essentially. So I think all you can do is do your best. And one thing that we always try to do is, even if they're pushing back on something and they don't agree with something we're doing, what we always do is say, hey, these are the reasons you should do it. We can do whatever you want, but we just are recommending against it right now. So that if for some reason they come back later and they're upset about the decision, we're like, hey, we told you all the reasons you shouldn't have done that and you still wanted to move forward. So they really can't say anything at that point. Were, were you going to say something to that too? The scope creep talk had a lot, had, that's a really good. Yeah. Yeah, the scope creep talk is really good. Definitely recommend you check that out if you're interested in this. Yeah. So in our sales process, we've kind of implemented these red flag metrics where we'll say, like, this is a big indicator that this is going to be either a bad customer or someone who's just not going to work well with us specifically, yeah. or whether it's somebody else. Um, but I was just wondering how you guys balance something like what potentially might be a red flag metric, but could also, like, how do you balance that and like, wanting to go above and beyond in the sales process and be super responsive? Um, like, in our case, one is, like, if someone like, has to jump on a call today, like, I guess I'm just wondering how you guys might balance something like that. Yeah, I think during the sales process, it's it's a little more challenging. I think you need to be willing to make some, be a little more flexible. You know, like I think once, and again, it's because during the sales process, that's when you're setting those expectations. So if you know if you have someone who's like, oh, I have to hop on the phone now, it's like, okay, yeah, I can do that. Don't expect that when you sign. Like that's not the level of service. It's, again, it's just being honest, being transparent, telling them, hey, right now I want to be there for you, and it's because you want to sell them. <laughs> like, but even at that point, tell them, hey, I'm, I'm happy to help you now, but we, we, have, we don't have this kind of bandwidth to do this all the time. We're busy, we have other clients. And typically, if you try to be honest, they'll be okay with that. But if their reaction to that is that's unacceptable, you probably don't want to work with them. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? It also, he was talking for, I work with Cody, so he, uh, our salespeople are really good about telling us that kind of stuff too, like this guy, you know, he was in the sales process, but he's not going to be your main contact, so you don't need to worry about it, or he really needs, you know, a phone call, not an email, that kind of thing, so that helps, again, with that, knowing up front how to communicate with people so that you can just go ahead and get set. Not that we should drop everything to call them that second, but if you know a phone call is better than an email, Going ahead and have that in your mind. Yeah. Yeah. This is referencing that scope creep we talked before. Do you guys go through the statement of work process after the proposal? No. So the way that she does things is a little different from us, and I'm definitely going to bring some of her ideas over and kind of talk through it with our sales team some because I, I like a lot of what she said. Um, our scope of work is included like when we in the whole proposal, um, like what I assume most people do. Um, and I don't know which one would be better. You know, it's kind—it's—it's of, it's really tough to say. What are the two? What's the? What's, what does she talk about? So the way she does things is, she has the person like sign the proposal with like an estimated cost, essentially, like a range. And then after that, they agree to the contract. She creates a full like statement of work, a scope of work, with a an accurate price assigned to it. And then the person signs it. And then she also includes whatever the budget for the project is. She sets aside thirty percent of that for like changes. So if anything is out of that statement of work, um, they pull from that 30% budget that's already been established at the very beginning of the project. Another idea she had that I really like, that I really want us to implement is, having a scope of work is great, but she also says that she uh, itemizes like what's out of scope. And I think that's a really good idea because again, because everything is possible here, you know, people just assume so much. So even if it isn't included in the scope of work, I've had clients who are like, well, isn't that normal? Isn't that on every website? Isn't that just included? And it's like, well, no, it's not. But they don't know that, and you know you can't expect them to. And so I think outlining those things as well is really, really helpful. Yeah. You know, I, I was kind of um, overwhelmed with your talk because there was so much documentation. Clearly, she must have much larger clients than I, because I can't imagine 
people wanting to sign off on everything. I mean, she was literally saying, they want to make a change, and it's a hundred dollar change. I'm not doing it until they okay it. And I'm just like, in my world, I don't think that's really realistic, but she's probably, it's probably very beneficial and lucrative to her. And I was just wondering how do you handle changes along the way? Do you, do you actually call and force them to okay something and then move on? Or do you just send an email like, this is to make you aware that this is happening and the charge will be X. And then they just say, yeah, go for it. I mean, how formal, how detailed do you get? It's, it's, we don't have the solution. I'll start by saying that. We are definitely still trying to figure that out. Um, one, it kind of just depends on the scope of the change. If it's super quick and simple, and I know I can knock it out in a couple minutes. Um, yeah, I, she said a $50 change, but if it's something where you think it might be. Yeah, I kind of also depends yeah. on the state, the, the, uh, where in the project you are. Yeah, like I know for our process, we typically try to hold all changes till the very end. We actually have like a feedback process so that if they do have any like specific preferences and stuff, we can make sure we take those into account. Um, but like, by like keeping it within that very end of the project, we tell them you have 12 hours allotted for these revisions, and I'm super explicit every step of the way of, okay, all those changes you gave us, they're within this timeline, or if I know it's gonna go over, I'm like, we're gonna estimate how long it takes to do each item, and then you can choose what you wanna do, what you wanna hold off on, what you're willing to pay more money for. So that has worked pretty well for us, but even then, it's hard to get people to understand why things cost what they cost and to get them to agree to the, those changes. If, if early in the project they, they want to, suddenly they want some kind of custom form or map or, you know, something that is several hours worth of work, we will, we do change orders yeah. from time to time. Yeah, if I know it's going to be like thousands of dollars that have a huge, like, are really going to alter the project. Hundreds yeah, hundreds. yeah, if, if it's more than a couple hundred bucks, I'm going to do a formal change order for sure. Yeah. Uh, something that, that can work for the less formal, so one way is a stock guy to get a really good kickoff call. Mm -hmm. uh, but something on the other end of things, if we're not talking like the integration advanced functionality or something like that, uh, reserve it for training, show them how to do it. That's something we do too, yeah. So we're using Beaver Builder or something like that. Show them how to do it. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. Let's come to that in training. I'm going to show you how to do it. That, that's a really good point. I'm glad you brought that up. I actually just did that with a client this week. Uh, if I know that there are changes they can easily make and it's just going to be tedious back and forth. And the other thing with tiny changes like that is they really have the, uh, they typically snowball where it's like, and she kind of mentioned that in, in the scope creep talk where it's like, oh yeah, I'll make that one quick change and switch out that image. But then that turns into switching out 50 images and now you've spent hours doing this. Um, the expectation is that I can quality money down and just yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you say, hey, like, I understand you want to change that, but you're probably going to want to change other things down the road, that's something you can easily do when we train you, and it's going to take you a little bit of time to do it. Because otherwise, I mean, like I said, they're going to keep having more ideas. They're going to want to be creative as they start to see the finished product. So telling them you're going to have the power to change that help, helps that. Yeah? I, I made something called a, a website cost estimator that I go over with my clients, and the, like when they go, well, how much is this going to cost? I said, well, let's get this website cost estimator. It's gravity form. Yeah. One of the first, I mean, the first question is what kind of site, you know, is it a refresh? Is it, you know, and this is for the middle of the range clients, not the, like, really high end. Right. With big staffs and so forth. But, like, well, what kind of client are you going to be? Are you, do you have champagne taste and you want it like you want it? Oh, that's an extra $2,000. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to have to pull it out of you. That's an extra $750. Are you going to be collaborative and we're going to get this going? Well, that doesn't add anything to the ultimate price. And it's funny. They laugh and they know who they are. Yeah. And so actually going through, it actually asks every question about what they want what they have, and they realize that there's, oh, do you want one contact form? That's included. Do you want a whole a, a HIPAA compliant, you know, da-da-da? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's extra, you know? And so they feel like you didn't just go out to the parking lot and see what kind of car they were driving to <laughs> find out how much you price it for. But the best thing about it is because you've had that conversation, you can easily go back. It kind of breaks the ice about going back. Remember? You didn't get the champagne taste. We're getting into champagne taste territory. Mm. So should we either do it late? You can add this later, or you can, you know, but you know, 40 revisions isn't <laughs> that kind of thing. It allows you, to, in a funny way, to bring back what they said before, and they know it. And yeah. it's, it's great. Breaks the ice. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. What does your training process look like? Um, so we tailor it to, depending on the client, depending on what plugins and features their website has and kind of what their skill level is with WordPress already. Um, we do have a template that we kind of omit and add things to depending on it. But essentially I send an email to the client when I'm scheduling the training. I'm like, hey, what's your level of experience with WordPress? Do you need training on really basic stuff like photo resizing so that you can make sure these images fit in the right sections? And then what sections of the website are you going to be changing most frequently? And then I make sure that during the training we're honing in on those things. I was actually talking to one of the... No, it's, it's in person. They come, to, they come to our office. I set up a user account for everyone in the training before they come into the office. Okay. And then I walk through um, how to make those specific changes with them walking through on their computers as well. Okay. And I actually heard someone, I was talking to, I believe Sarah, one of the organizers here, and she was saying that she actually creates um, like videos of those same exact things that she can give to the client so that they have those to use. We have something like that, but we call it our knowledge base. It's a part of our support system where it's the same exact thing. It's, it's screen recordings of how to make those changes. So we, we, have, we try to give as many resources as we can so that they can make those changes if they want to. Okay. Yeah. Do you do training before or after lunch? It depends. Yes. <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> I, ideally, we do it uh, after the project is launched. We like to be that kind of be the wrap up of everything. Um, but like I said, I have a client where they, this week literally, they were over the revisions time and I told them and I was like, you can definitely make these changes and I can train you before we launch so that it'll be ready by the time we do go live. So it kind of just depends on what needs to be done still and what the client prefers. Mm -hmm. well, we kind of make one back and forth with that question to you in our own agency because we feel like it's a nice way to hand everything off but then if we wait till after launch, some of them, aren't ready for a training months, you know, months down the road because they're not available. Mm. And then we do it, and then they have changes they want to make and all this stuff. And of course we have, well, this is out of scope, this wasn't in the proposal, but it's still like we just don't, don't want to have to deal with that. Yeah. So, but then it's like, well, if we want to launch it, but we want to train you before we launch, and you're not available, then we can't launch You can never launch the site. Yeah, so we we try to do a case by case. Yeah, and I think too, again, it's about setting those expectations. Like if you tell the client really early on, like, hey, we train you, but if you're unavailable for months, like don't expect us to then be able to make a bunch of changes, you know? Like they may be, you know, upset or frustrated about it, but I mean, if you make that clear on the front end, there's really nothing they can say. We, we also, in our monthly fee charge, I don't know my words, what we charge the clients each month includes like X number of hours for the year of us doing the stuff. So um, some clients don't want to get trained and they'll they'll even buy the ex extra support credit so that we just do it all. Yeah. <laughs> Having some alternative. They, our clients really run the gamut. Some some are like lawyers with no time at all and they don't even want to look at the site and they trust us implicitly. And then other people don't want to pay us a dime because they're a nonprofit and they have no Wasn't budget. Wasn't that because of a theme update? Isn't that why? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that yeah. That word is misspelled. Yeah. <laughs> Right, yeah. I think it's really case by case. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, so, I kind of want to go back to the, I think it was on the first slide you had, where most people work with you guys because of your team. I mm -hmm. think that's like a super, it seems so simple, but it's a really important uh, aspect of all of this. Um, but I guess my question is I think that a lot of people, the real support aspect is also super important. <coughs> really like your team. A lot of it's technical work support too, but it's actually the support and the communication that is equally as important. Um, but for you guys, in terms of that communication, where do you guys keep that information in terms of, like, this client likes to get emails, this client likes to get super long emails, this one likes short ones, this one likes calls. Do you guys keep that, like, in a client base somewhere? Yeah, so, uh Documentation, document, documentation, documentation. We have, <laughs> we use HubSpot CRM, um, and so we typically, every email we send is logged there, and we can organize them chronologically and search for anything. Uh, any notes from phone calls or meetings go in there for anything pertinent that was discussed. The sales team puts all of their notes in there for us to check when we're starting the project. And then also I typically carry all of that over to Google Drive where we keep all our build assets and stuff so that my team can see that as well if they need access. Mm -hmm. And HubSpot CRM is free, so. Anyone else? Awesome, well thank y'all so much, I'm really glad you came. Yeah.